Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's uh, great to be here in Gothenburg and uh, a real privilege to address you at this, uh, this conference. Um, I work for Thames Water, as Per Arne said. Uh, Thames Water are the largest uh, water company in the United Kingdom. Um, I think I'd just like to say a few things first to, to, to provide a bit of context. I, I'm, I'm very proud uh, to work for an organisation. Uh, I've actually been there 40 years as of last month. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry that you... <laughs> I've got a long way to get to your 400. But um, I, I think I'd just like to say I'm proud to work for an organisation that takes sustainability so seriously. And uh, a number of years ago, um, we recognised the importance of reducing carbon emissions and to set ourselves a challenging target of uh, reducing emissions by 34% by 2020 compared with 1990 levels. So I think that's quite a challenging target for a water company. And in terms of some of the things we've been doing, um, over the last few years we've uh, installed uh, photovoltaic cells or solar panels uh, at a number of our sites in and around London. And we've currently got an area equivalent to 10 football pitches. Um, which produces 3,500 megawatt hours. So that's one thing we've done. And in addition to that, 16% uh, of our power needs are derived by burning uh, biomethane gas uh, generated from our sewage sludge digestion. So from a sort of project point of view, uh, one of the things that we've done recently is that we have signed up to uh, something that's quite important for infrastructure projects in the UK, which is called the Infrastructure Carbon Review, to ensure that we deliver best practice in terms of sustainability. Right, so I think um, before I go any further, I'll just uh, highlight and talk about the problem. So hopefully this plays. Well, this, as you will recognise, is uh, an aerial shot through London, and I'm sure you can see the London Eye there, Houses of Parliament, and um, soon you'll see, as we focus into a point on the river, something... <laughs> something that's very familiar in cities around Europe and the world, um, the problem we have with combined sewer overflow discharges into the river. This is one uh, in Chelsea, and you can see some of the effects it has in terms of the river and the fish and the aquatic environment. And I know it's a problem shared by many cities. So in terms of the, the sort of key points I want to get over in terms of the presentation, uh, firstly, the need for the project, um, the scope of the proposed project, um, the development consent application, which is a, a planning permission, in any other words, and in terms of the legacy objectives we've set ourselves for the project. I think the important thing to say here is that the word sustainability doesn't appear on that slide, um, and sustainability is embedded in all we do. Um, it's part of our culture. Um, there are 450 people working on the project team, and it's, in, it's part of the job we do every day. Um, it's not a lot of, it loses its power, this presentation, if I don't spend a few minutes explaining the problem we've got, because without fully understanding the problem, it's difficult to understand the context of the solution. Um, London's catchment has been drained uh, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years by a number of tributaries, as you can see, the blue lines on that diagram um, that flow down into the River Thames. And over the last 300 years or so, um, many, the vast majority of those rivers and tributaries have been contained in some way, in either a brick brick or a concrete culvert, um, therefore containing the, the flow so that people could develop um, both sides of the culvert and in some cases on top of it. Um, so that went on for many years and uh, was part of London's natural drainage. Um, it wasn't up until 1830 that we had a bit of a problem. Keyes spoke earlier of um, not repeating the mistakes from our predecessors, um, but a decision was made, an Act of Parliament was passed in 1830, whereby foul water could be discharged into what was basically this rainfall and land drainage collection system. So um, it doesn't take a lot of imagination. London was expanding rapidly in the early 1800s, 
and uh, between 1830, uh, the situation in terms of the river got pretty dire. The, the river became septic and black, and uh, it led to a, a very famous event in 1858 called the Great Stink, where the smell from the river was so bad uh, that Parliament could no longer sit in Westminster, and they all had to go to Oxford for a couple of years. Um, but anyway, the key point about it is it provided the catalyst, as indeed uh, people have mentioned previously, some th sometimes a catalyst is needed to inspire action, and it provided the catalyst for a chap called Sir Joseph Bazalgett um, to build the intercepting sewers. And the intercepting sewers do what they say on the can, and they intercepted the flow. So instead of the flow and the sewage going into the river, they were built at a level beneath the culverts. There was a hole put in the culvert, and the flow was diverted into the intercepting sewer, and it took the sewage off to East London on the right-hand side there, um, where it was held in balancing tanks um, before it was flushed out on the outgoing tide. So that gives you a bit of a background of the history of London's sewage system and how it's um, evolved over many hundreds of years. But I think the key point to take from this is that Sir Joseph Balzajat built the intercepting sewers in the 1860s, and they still form the backbone of London's sewerage system today. That's the key point. Um, Sir Joseph Bazalgette was a, a very visionary Victorian engineer, um, and in the 1860s, there were around 200 million, sorry, 2 million people in London. Um, he had the vision to design a system for 4 million people, and to give you some idea of the population in London at the moment, it's around about uh, 8 million people, and it's predicted that there will be an additional million people in London uh, between now and 2030. So it doesn't take a lot of imagination, um, bearing in mind it's a combined system, to understand why those discharges happened that you saw on the video uh, earlier. So in a typical year, or an average year, 39 million tonnes of sewage is discharged into the Tidal River Thames in London. Um, in fact, last year, which was slightly wetter, there was 55 million cubic metres, or tonnes, whichever you prefer, discharged into the river, and that's happening on average um, about um, once a week. So, um, it was known for a number of years that there was this significant problem, and in the year 2000, a group was set up called the Thames Tideway Strategic Study Group, um, and they were tasked with um, looking at, you know, defining exactly what the problem was and coming up with a number of solutions that could potentially overcome the problem. So there are a number on here. Action before sewer, that's source control and sustainable drainage systems. I think the first thing to say is Thames absolutely support sustainable drainage systems, um, and we support what's in our policy documents and the London plan. And um, certainly for any new buildings, um, we would absolutely support, obviously, the importance of separating um, foul water and rainwater. And there indeed are some schemes we're putting in and some trials we're running that Richard will mention um, coming up um, in, a, in an area called Counters Creek in London. So I think the, the, main, the main point in terms of why that shows with a red cross is the scale of the problem we've got in London and the amount of combined sewage um, there is when we get anything like two millimetres or more of rainfall. So it's, it's the scale of the problem. It's the density of urbanisation that we've got in London, um, the density particularly of housing in, in West London and other parts of the city. And in terms of that solution, it, it's, it's more difficult in a city which is underlaid by clay and saturated gravels because there isn't the ability for water to soak away. Um, and then also, because of the scale of London and the, and the scale of the problem, it would have been a massive issue in terms of both cost. We estimated the solution in terms of action before sewers at about £13 billion. And also, there would be a massive amount of disru disruption because a lot of the roads in London would need to be dug up. The second solution uh, within sewer network um, was looking at local storage, uh, attenuation as we would call it, and separation, and the potential of building a separate new foul uh, water um, sewerage system. And again, that was of the order of about 13 or 14 billion pounds. The final red cross was in river. We have a number of 
um, vessels that when uh, sewage is discharged into the river, we send them out to inject um, hydrogen peroxide or to get oxygen into the river. And um, when there's been a large discharge to make sure that we don't get too much oxygen or we, we reduce the impact on oxygen depletion in the river and also skimmer vessels to pick up all the um, tissues, plastics that get discharged. Um, but that would need hundreds of those vessels. It would only treat the symptom rather than the cause, and it wouldn't have any significant effect, if any, on river water quality. So that's why that got that final red cross. So in terms of the, the, the final box on here, intercept overflows, which is the single tunnel option that we're proposing, and we've now got... Um, uh, per planning permission to um, go ahead with is the central storage and transfer option uh, which is offered by the um, single tunnel that we propose to build. So I think the main thing that I would like to stress about this slide is that um, we, in making that decision, took a holistic view uh, in relation to sustainability, um, considering all aspects of environment, um, economic and social and feel that we made the right solution um, in relation to London. I think it's worth stressing that it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right solution for every city. Um, where people are building new cities or new developments, which are, um, people have mentioned this morning, obviously very important to separate foul water and, uh, and waste water, sorry, foul water and rainwater. Um, so that's really important. And also, if you have the land available, and you, you, from what my limited view of Gothenburg today, you don't have the density pr problem that we have in London. If you have more open areas and more green space, etc., then you have more options open to you in terms of sustainable drainage systems. Right, in terms of the London Tideway improvements, there are three aspects of this programme of work. Um, firstly, to upgrade the five tidal sewage treatment works in London, which is shown by the orange blobs on the diagram. I won't, uh, I won't go through each of them. Um, the next uh, part of this programme of work was to build the Lee Tunnel, which is seven kilometres of tunnel from Abbey Mills Pumping Station, as shown to the sewage treatment works at Beckton. Um, that's 7.2 metres in diameter, uh, as I say, 7 kilometres long. And the final part of the jigsaw is to build the Thames Tideway Tunnel, um, which is from Acton in West London through to Abbey Mills Pumping Station um, and join up with the Lead Tunnel. It joins the same diameter, it joins at the same invert level at Abbey Mills, and it falls at the same gradient. Um, and Abbey Mills is very close to the Olympic Park. So in terms of the impact, when we've... Um, sorry, that's uh, gone a bit quicker than I thought. Um, when we've um, built the sewage treatment works on the lead tunnel, um, we will have an effect on... We will reduce the amount of discharge, uh, particularly into the River Lee, and um, from some of the sewage treatment works as well. But it's not until we build the Thames Tidewood Tunnel, if you can see, these are each of the main discharge points on the river. Um, and if you think when we build the Thames Tideway Tunnel, um, you can see how much they are reduced. And when the time, Thames Tideway Tunnel solution is in place, we will intercept 95% of the current amount of discharge that goes out into the river. So in terms of the proposed route and construction sites, um, the, the main point is to mention that um, the cost of the project is £4.2 billion. Pounds. I worked that out to be about 46 billion Swedish kroner. Um, so it's, uh, it is an expensive project. Uh, pa Arne mentioned that uh, it was the, it's the largest privately financed in infrastructure project in Europe. So it is, it is a big project by any standards. Um, the yellow blobs are the three main drive sites we need for the project. Um, the one in the centre at 11, we drive both west to seven, um, which is in Hammersmith, and from Southwark at 11, we drive um, east to, to uh, ele sorry, 11 is in Battersea, and we drive to 17, which is in Southwark, and then we drive from those points to the reception sites, which are at both Acton and Abbey Mill. So that creates the main tube of the tunnel, the main 7.2 metre diameter tunnel. There are a couple of small connection tunnels, which I won't go into now, but those are picking up other discharge points. And the key point to mention 
um, is that there are 17 interception shafts which are built adjacent to the existing discharge point which will intercept that flow, take it down through a small connecting tunnel into the main tunnel and take it off to Abbey Mills onto uh, Beckton Sewage Treatment Works um, where it will be treated. Right, so in terms of tunnel dimensions, I mentioned 25 kilometres and 7.2 metres in diameter. Uh, the tunnel falls at a gradient of one metre in every 790 metres and um, has a volume of 1.6 million cubic metres. So it is a big tunnel. And I think the point I would like to get over here is scale of the problem. Um, in relation to, if you can picture, this is the lead tunnel that we've, we've bored the main tunnel. We're doing the secondary lining now. So if you can imagine standing there in this tunnel, which is wide enough to get three London double-decker buses side by side, and by the time we've constructed the lead tunnel and joined the Thames Tideway Tunnel, you will be able to walk from that point uh, for 32 kilometres. So I think that tries to help explain the sort of volume of combined uh, sewage overflows that we need to deal with, and that will make up 1.6 million cubic metres. And the key point to note is um, if that was in, in place today, it would fill totally uh, seven times a year. It would fill on average at some point once a week, but seven times a year it would fill in its entirety. So that's the scale of the problem we have to deal with. Um, I won't go through all the fact that it goes through all of London's geology um, from those sites, those drive sites, the three in the middle and the two reception sites each side. It goes down to a depth of 65 metres. Um, so if you can imagine being on a 22-storey building somewhere, if you go to a building that's got 22 storeys, it's, it's that distance underground. So it is a deep tunnel. It goes under virtually all of London's infrastructure. It goes under 45 other tunnels. So we carried out a lot of consultation on the project. Um, there's a few dots on here. Um, we originally, in the first phase of consultation, wrote to uh, a third of a million Londoners, um, which was an interesting exercise. I learnt from that not to have my signature on all of those letters. <laughs> so if anyone's doing that in future, I suggest you get someone else to put their name on it, because um, it generates quite a lot of correspondence, and you make some friends you didn't realise you needed to make. Um, so we went out and had a very wide consultation. It lasted 30 months. But the key thing about it was we went out with our provisional plans. Um, we listened to what people had to say. And where we could, we amended those plans. And then we went out for a second phase of consultation. But a key thing about that uh, in relation to sustainability and environment particularly is that we listened to what people said. One of the key bits of feedback from the 9,400 responses we had was wherever you can, use the river for transport, don't use London's congested roads. So a couple of key points from that. One, don't make air quality in London any worse than you need to, because um, we have a problem with it currently. And two, don't disrupt our lives by blocking up all the roads so we can't get either our children to school in the mornings or, or get to work. Um, we are very proud that through the last six and a half years, we've never um, refused to give anyone a briefing on the project if they've requested one. Right, in terms of our de development consent, uh, Pa Harney was right, it's the largest planning application ever made in the UK. Um, it's a nationally significant infrastructure project, that's why it comes under the Planning Act 2008. Um, we submitted in total 125,000 pages as part of our application, um, so it was a massive document. Um, there was a six month examination and there were 45 hearings, so there was a lot of rigour. Key things to point, we submitted a sustainability statement uh, with our documentation and we submitted an environmental statement that went to 25,000 pages long. So lots of analysis of the effect we would have on the environment and what measures we could put in place in relation to mitigation. And I mentioned the transportation one a second ago. But the good news is um, we have convinced uh, most experts in the UK, um, the environmental regulator, um, the, the government departments that relate to the environment and the government itself, and we have been awarded a development consent order which has given us the green light to proceed. I don't think we've quite convinced Richard yet, but I'll let Richard explain that in a moment. Right, in terms of legacy objectives, uh, we've produced a document. I've got one here, if anyone's uh, 
Kinsayat, which relates to our legacy, and it's about how we um, maximize opportunities for providing res residual beneficial effects for the project. And it relates to what I talked about earlier, mainly around environment, uh, economic and social. Environment, obviously, the vast improvement we'll make in terms of river water quality, obviously being the main one, making sure that we don't cause any more problem than we have to in terms of air quality, but also biodiversity and looking at how we can improve migration routes for fish, etc. Um, health and safety is really important to us as a project. We have a, a, a target zero policy, um, which is very important to our business, and we very much intend to raise the bar in terms of health and safety performance on major infrastructure projects. In terms of the economy, it's, uh, the project will provide a huge boost to London's economy. It also, in its uh, peak, will provide 9,350 jobs. In relation to people, um, our, our target is to make London, which for many years, because of the, the state of the river, uh, look away from the river. Our, our target in relation to people is to get people in London to understand the benefits of the river so that London's more facing the river rather than facing away from it. And people enjoy the river and, and enjoy the recreational activities and opportunities on it. And in terms of place, there are a number of places where we need to build out into the river where we'll create additional public realm. And it's very key that uh, people have the opportunity to use them and be able to enjoy the river and their recreation. Um, in terms of um, the project legacy, um, there's just there's a few instances. This is Blackfriars on the Victorian Embankment, not very far from Westminster, um, where you can see um, what it looks like now and what it looks like in the future and how we can um, utilize that public realm so people um, can, can enjoy it and enjoy using that space. Um, and enjoy, um, enjoy the river. They can see all the way from there to House of Parliament, London Eye, and Canary Wharf, which is in the background. Um, this is at a park in um, a, a borough called Tower Hamlets, where, because of where the discharge point is, uh, we have to intercept it either in the park or in the foreshore. So another good example about how um, we've increased the public realm, how we've integrated it into the park, and we will extend the park and provide opportunities for people to enjoy it and to be able to use it to uh, inter interact with the river. So in terms of timeline, um, uh, we have our planning award. Um, we, we are going about setting up a separate company um, which is another presentation in itself, um, to finance and deliver the project. Um, so we're currently ca carrying out the procurement for that. We will appoint someone to be the infrastructure provider uh, next summer, and they will also take on the contracts with the main construction work contractors, which we're currently evaluating the tenders for. Start of construction will be uh, uh, early 2016, and the project will be completed in 2023. So in terms of um, summary, hopefully I've outlined the need and the scope of the project, explained the planning, planning process and the importance of consultation, um, talked about the fact that we've got this um, development consent order so that we can proceed with the project, and um, also um, highlighted some of the legacy and some of the wider residual benefits. But I think most importantly, I think ho hopefully what I've tried to explain is it's not the right solution for every city, but hopefully I've helped you understand why we've made this choice in London and the fact that we honestly believe, looking at um, sustainability holistically, looking at environment, economic and social, that we've made the right choice in selecting this project for London. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'll just start with one question. Um, I'm curious about the responsibilities, um, responsibilities of Thames Water, because you're talking about waterfront and parks, which you are going to plan and develop. Is that within your uh, commission? Um, well, I think, I think the main thing is we, we will actually build them and put them in place but yeah. Thames Water isn't a company that looks after public areas and parks. Um, oh, okay. So we would provide a commuted sum, as oh, we would okay. call it, 
to the, to, the, to the respective London borough, and they would carry out, if you like, the maintenance on our behalf on a long-term basis. Okay. Questions to Phil? Lykke first, I think. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lykke Leonardsen from the city of Copenhagen, and I would actually want to get back to your slide with the red crosses and the, the, the one green tick, and, and ask you, you put it up as if it, it, it was it was either or. Couldn't it be both? Uh, couldn't well. you reduce uh, the 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 uh, the uh, the tunnel uh, by having also using actions before sewers and within sewer networks and so on? Does it have to be an either or? Well, the answer is it definitely doesn't have to be either or. And uh, a tunnel solution and sustainable drainage system are mutually exclusive and you are absolutely right that um, we need to do both and that's why I mentioned uh, the work we're doing at Counters Creek which Richard will talk about in a moment so we are we are working to put in sustainable drainage systems because I think the way I would look at it is, is though all we although we've got this massive problem currently because of the volume of combined sewer sewage overflows we need to deal with. In terms of sustainability in the longer term, we need to make sure new developments um, have separate foul water and rainwater, which we absolutely do. And wherever we can, uh, we make sure that the, the rainwater is taken to a water course and doesn't become part of the problem. A and by doing that, we also need to make sure that we make the solution we put in place last longer because it future-proofs it because we're not at keeping adding to the problem. So it is absolutely the thing we need to do on all new development. It, it would be difficult to understand how you would change the scale of the tunnel we're putting in currently because of the amount of old 100-year-plus housing stock that we have in London. But that said, we must have both solutions together. Klaus Johansson, politician from Gothenburg. Uh, a question, I didn't really, really understand what happens at the end of the tunnel. Is there a wastewater treatment plant that has the capacity of all this water? Uh, there absolutely is, and I apologise that in most of the presentations, I go a bit longer, I do explain um, what we've done in relation to the sewage treatment works. We just upgraded the five I mentioned and spent £675 million on the um, five sewage treatment works. But the one at Beckton... Um, which will receive the flow from the Lee Tunnel and the Thames Tunnel, has had its capacity in the last three years increased by 60%. So it's gone from 17 metres cubed per second capacity to 27 metres cubed capacity. So the flow will be pumped up. It's 65 metres deep at Abbey Mills. It's actually 75 metres deep by the time it gets to Beckton. It will be pumped up and treated before it's discharged into the river. More questions? Yeah. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, a, a question about uh, the way you treat water. Um, I was really impressed when I did the assessment of the city of Hamburg that they have a huge uh, wastewater treatment facility. They produce a lot of methane and actually the whole installation to treat wastewater is energy neutral. So the investment is really paying back. They don't do yet a lot of nutrient recovery, but that is currently taking place in Amsterdam. Have you in mind to produce such an advanced wastewater treatment where you can also make a or contribution to the CO2 reduction targets because methane is a huge uh, uh, problem, of course. Are you gonna do that in London? Right, okay. Well, I think, I think the first thing to say is that uh, Beckton and Hamburg are often quoted as the two largest sewage treatment works in Europe, so, so that they, do have, they do have things in common. But certainly, we're doing everything we can there to recover as much energy as possible um, to make sure that uh, we are as carbon neutral as we can be. And certainly, there's an example in the UK, which has been in the press recently, where one water company... Uh, in the south of England has put in a sewage treatment works that is actually uh, energy neutral. So it can be done, and we have, 
we, our first um, priority was to extend the work so it's got treatment capacity to take the extra flow, but we, are, we have a number of projects, uh, thermal hydrolysis amongst them, which is going to increase our, uh, how um, self-sufficient we are in terms of energy at Vecton. So that is what we intend to do. We haven't got quite as far as nutrient recovery yet, I would hasten to add. You're on the good way, thank you. Okay. Some last question. I, j okay. I just wonder, uh, here are some, some people in the audience from Malmö, and they are planning a similar tunnel in Malmö, although a little smaller and cheaper. <laughs> Still expensive. <laughs> what would be your advice to Malmö? What, what to do and not to do? <laughs> Okay. Um, well, what stage are they in terms early of the Early stages. Very early stages. Um, well, I, I think, uh, like the lady uh, from Copenhagen said, my advice would be to um, integrate as much sustainable drainage as you can, because it, it is the two hand in hand. And I think, I think one of the issues we've had is that if you polarise it on just a tunnel solution, you do tend to... Um, alienate the people who support sustainable drain systems. So that's probably uh, a mistake we made. Um, but I, I would just think that you, you need to be confident you've got a sustainable solution, which I'm sure you will be, but the importance of going out and talking to people about it uh, and consulting with people and, and having public meetings and, and, and making sure that the wider stakeholders... Because at the end of the day, if you're... I don't know exactly where Melma your tunnel is, but if you're in a, an urban environment, um, you know, some of the greater challenges are, are stakeholders and, and selling the need for what you're doing uh, and selling the fact that you're going to be working close to where some of those people live uh, and taking on board people's concerns and, and as much as you can, taking those concerns on board so that you do as much mitigation as possible so that uh, people understand what you're doing, they understand what they're paying for and they understand that you're going to do everything you can to minimise disruption. That would be my advice in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Happy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.